Um, okay, we'll try and make this quick and then we can all go for lunch. Um, so yeah, I'm Tom. Um, if oh yeah, my slide hasn't changed. Let's do that. Maybe I can't run it in full screen. Let's try again. Is it going to swap? Oh, it did that time. Okay, so I'm Tom. Um, if anyone knows me online, I'm uh, the Magical Trout. Um, my background is in data analytics, data processing. Um, and I happen to be moonlighting as a DevOps person, sort of. Um, I run a small ops consultancy, but it was basically set up um, because I currently work for NASA, um, for JPL in the data applications group. Um, when I was brought into NASA, I wasn't brought in as a DevOps guy. <laughs> I was brought in as a Java developer. So, <laughs> so I sort of um, segued accidentally, or maybe on purpose, into doing DevOpsy type stuff. So what do we do at JPL? So, you know, we're in the data applications group. We, we build research platforms and data applications that can be small stuff for local groups or scale up to obviously multi-petabyte like to style deployments. Um, run on a whole range of systems. Um, don't ask me about the space stuff. They don't let me near it because I'm a foreign national, so they have some stupid rules that means I can't log onto their servers. Um, so I deal with um, the research projects, the stuff coming from the outside, um, and with third-party um, groups. So we, I've brought along a couple of examples today of stuff that um, we work on uh, with JPL and with other uh, groups beside that. And so one of them is genomic, genomics, search and research. You know, effectively we're writing a, a Google-style platform for genomics uh, research and for search um, for companies who want to be able to find stuff about certain genomes and stuff that happens within that. You know, there's an awful lot of uh, research going on these days with genomics, and so being able to facilitate um, the advancement of that is quite a cool thing to be able to do. Another project that we work on um, is to help improve security in the USA and abroad. Not like this, um, but a bit more like that. Um, so we work on this project called Memex. Um, most of it's open source, apart from some of the sort of top secret -y bits and pieces, but most of the stuff you can find on GitHub um, and you know, CNN and various places that profiled it. And so Memex is a project that um, mines the dark web. So, you know, most of you will know about the dark web and, um, you know, Silk Road and all that type of stuff. Um, of course, along with the drugs, there's also, you know, people trafficking, weapons smuggling, all that type of stuff that goes on in the dark web. And so Memex is a project run by DARPA um, to try and use machine learning and data discovery tools to find, um, you know, the, the naughty people. On the, on the internet, um, group them and do stuff like image search, image processing to automatically categorize, um, you know, stuff that's for sale on the Silk Road or whatever. Um, you know, that, that way it is an awful lot quicker than having a bunch of like FBI type guys looking at it. And it's quite cool as well because they're working with external partners. And so like in the UK, we're picking it up. We're going to run some Memex stuff in the UK for human trafficking and that type of stuff. And so, you know, it's a good project to um, to be involved in. So, you know, we run all these data applications, and so what like, underpins an awful lot of this stuff, and this is obviously just like a, a, a high level view of some of the stuff we use quite regularly. So, you know, TensorFlow, machine learning stuff these days, especially in the Python world, is all TensorFlow based stuff. You know, there might be a bunch of bits and pieces that sit on top of it, but, you know, boils down to TensorFlow. Um, you know, Spark for a lot of um, data processing, um, Solar for cataloging and indexing, that type of stuff, and Kubernetes, Mesos for, you know, uh, container support, that type of thing. So, our conundrum. This is how I sort of, like, segued into, into DevOps by mistake. Is it chopped it in half again? If the slides don't work, just shout out. There we go. Um, so, you know, NASA um, has an awful lot of beards kicking around, you know, they have all these researchers and these guys that, you know, um, like to be able to write code. So, it's done it again, hasn't it? 
It's not my day with uh, presentations. Try again. There we go. So, you know, the bearded guys at NASA make an awful lot of use of um, GitHub, GitLab, you know, anything that involves the word Git currently seems to be, you know, where they put code. Um, and so, uh, the reason I segued into this, uh, this uh, ops type role um, was because when I turned up there and this genomics research platform, um, I... <laughs> So I went to the first on-site meeting, and I was like, all right, guys, um, you know, how do we get this stuff into production? And they're like, oh, well, it's cool. Look, you SSH onto this box through this tunnel, and then you do git pull, Maven compile install, and then you copy the web apps from this place to this existing Tomcat server. You copy this solar core across. And I was like, are you for real? And they were like, yeah. So, you know, it wasn't the uh, easiest way to be able to deploy your software, and it wasn't really deploying your stuff into production. And let's do it again. So, you know, the flip side is, you know, system administrators, um, you know, don't particularly like GitHub for software deployment because, you know, it doesn't provide a package to be able to deploy your stuff. It just provides some source code. And so system administrators like binaries. They like stuff that they can say, here's a uh, stack of bytes. Um, you know, go and put that onto my server. But of course, they do like GitHub for storing Puppet stuff. And I expect it's dropped me in half again. There we go. So when we're building this stuff at JPL, you know, we have to think about um, various aspects when it comes to the platform deployment. Um, you know, Data locality is reasonably key because uh, JPL have a bunch of servers. JPL have a bunch of stuff. Um, like me, I'm not allowed into a bunch of this stuff, but then so are the external entities as well. Um, but not only that, data transfer around the globe is slow. So, you know, if, I'm, if we've got a research partner in Spain, um, we don't necessarily want to be hosting the data down in Australia because getting large amounts of data to them would take time and effort. So, you know, data locality is important, um, you know, for these users that are based around the world. Um, and so, you know, the, the need to be able to access data quickly and easily becomes more apparent. Um, and also, you know, data security as well. So when it comes to um, locking down data, it's something that they tend to take reasonably seriously, just in case the um, Russians get their hand on it. <coughs> So server requirements, the location is not as important as, uh, as when it comes to data locality because you've just got compute resource. Uh, but it does, of course, need to be able to scale. It needs to be able to scale, scale quickly. It needs to be able to scale easily, um, depending on what workload we're deciding to run on the platform at that given point in time. Also, you know, going back to that thing again, it needs to be able to live outside the NASA ecosystem because otherwise I can't see it. I might just leave that off. There we go. You can still see it, can you? So, um, software requirements as well. You know, the software itself needs to understand how to scale. You know, if you deploy a, a MySQL server, app get install MySQL, um, you know, that will get you a single node, but then how do you say, okay, well, I need a bunch of this to be able to scale up my data processing. Um, you know, how do I run that my master-slave replication or whatever that I requires for, you know, allowing that load to, uh, work properly. Um, the other thing as well is the software needs to be able to run in a bunch of different environments. We, you know, a lot of the stuff we test and develop on straight on AWS, but um, you know, sometimes, um, sometimes we run it somewhere else. So, projector won't show it very well, but um, so okay, it also needs to run on this, and this is. Um, the TAC Wrangler. Um, so some of the stuff we work with is in partnership with the Texas Advanced Computing Center. And Wrangler is one of the boxes there. I'm sorry if the projector doesn't really show it very well. It's only a bunch of servers. It's not that exciting. Um, but, you know, it's got, uh, you know, 10 petabytes of storage, 600 terabytes of flash storage, 3,000 cores. It's designed to do stuff that requires an awful lot of I.O. and it's both designed to do it quickly. Um, the problem with TAC and the way that they set stuff up is, for reasonably obvious reasons, you don't get root access. And because it's designed as a data processing platform, um, 
they don't really give you very much. They give you Python, some prepackaged stuff, um, a JDK, and that's about as far as it goes. So getting software onto that that's going to work in a repeatable manner um, was um, an interesting conundrum. So, you know, how do we approach this? When we, when we looked at all the stuff we were deploying, how we were deploying it, you know, what is the correct approach to take? Um, you know, and so it became a multifaceted thing because I don't think there's really a right or wrong answer. I know everyone has their own opinions about what they should be running and their DevOps stack and, you know, how that automation works. But, you know, I don't actually think there's a right answer. You know, you pick what works and what works for you. Um, <clears throat> So, you know, we use, in some cases, more traditional ops. We have a Puppet stack, you know, the sysadmins at NASA are used to using Puppet. They use Puppet all over the place, and so, you know, trying to get a system administrator to stop using Puppet, you know, isn't worth your effort. You know, you might as well just go and sit in a room by yourself for a while. Um, you know, and so the Puppet implementation controls LDAP, it will provision servers for us, it will install some bits and pieces, it will talk to AWS and make sure that um, the various buckets and what have you are signed properly. You know, it does the, the legwork to make sure that all the servers that we deploy, certainly in, the, um, in AWS and various other cloud-based services, um, work in the way that we want to and they're locked down appropriately. So. <coughs> The other thing as well was we wanted to be able to deploy the software onto, um, onto Wrangler in a way that was repeatable, that other people could do it, was preferably a one-liner. Um, and so, you know, one of the questions was, how are we going to do that? We can't get root access. We can't install a bunch of stuff on this software, on this um, server. Um, you know, so how do we get um, a, a systems management package of some sort onto that server that will allow us to make sure that when people install Memex or whatever they want to install on Wrangler, it's going to work time after time. And so, you know, we went through a bunch of the software and found that the only one that we could really install was um, Ansible. Um, but it transpires that it's actually been a really good, um, you know, choice to, to, to make and will allow us to um, repeatedly dis deploy the Memex stack, um, hook it up to the various subsystems in Wrangler, um, or, you know, fairly easily, and so, you know, it's the the Wrangler deployments are single instance. You're just deploying to local host, but actually be able to use Ansible to make sure that end users could do it, um, proved a very useful uh, mechanism, better than Bash scripts. So. Container orchestration, okay, so we also make use of a lot of containers, unsurprisingly. Um, some of the DevOps guys like Swarm, personally I hate Swarm, but you know, everyone's allowed their own opinion. Um, and we also deploy Mesos and a bit of Kubernetes for larger um, deployments. Um, and also Mesos allows you to deploy non-container based stuff, um, and so it is a very useful way of being able to deploy um, containers alongside Hadoop stack or something like that. Um, against your cluster. Um, and of course, the containers allow us to build multiple stuff in different environments. The container build chain is pretty straightforward. You know, we pull our stuff, most of our stuff's hosted on GitHub. Um, there's a Maven Docker plugin because most of the stuff we write is Java based. So, Spotify wrote a Maven Docker plugin, which is great because we can just plug the, the Docker file build into the back end of the, the main server, um, main service build, um, and then we pump it out to a Docker repo. Of course, containers are, in some respects, very useful. Developers love containers. If, if you find me a software developer that doesn't love a container, then, you know, I don't know what planet they've been on. Um, containers are great for developers. They can obviously build that stuff. They can send it up to Jenkins, whatever, then do Docker pull, Docker run, and they have that software running in a box, and they know if I go and deploy that to a server, it's going to be the same set of bits. You know, it's going to work the same. Um, but they do pose problems for production. At NASA, they have like strict rules over, that oh, Merlin? Um, you know, they have strict rules over user and group mappings. Um, yet we want to be able to run the same um, Docker container um, on different servers with different user group mappings. And of course, if you use the, um, the Docker file to spec that user out, then when it comes to runtime, the user group will be different. Um, so we have to like start hacking around with the entry points and that type of stuff to start mapping that thing around. Wrangler can't run into containers because Wrangler's pretty dumb. Um, 
and you know, keeping them patched with security flaws. You know, who is in charge of the thousands of containers that get deployed across JPL when um, you know, heart bleed strikes or whatever? So you know, we then get on to the third um, aspect of our deployments, and so that's using the Juju stack. So um, you know, we came to. I, I was using Juju before I started at JPL, so I had some sort of background in that type of stuff. Um, and it seemed like quite a good fit for the stuff that we were trying to do, where we want developer, developers to be able to spin up loads, we want to be able to deal with scale. Um, and so, you know, what Juju allows us to do is it allows users, as opposed to system administrators, to select their applications. You know, you don't necessarily have to ring up the sysadmin and say, I need MySQL installed. You know, you can just drop it onto your... Um, onto your model. It allows users to deal with scale. You know, Juju is excellent at dealing with the scalability side of deploying of code. So, you know, you can scale up a Hadoop cluster in a couple of clicks of a mouse. You can scale up a MySQL cluster. You know, you can do all that um, via command line or via a GUI, and it doesn't require technical knowledge or, you know, the writing of some fancy DSL to make it happen. Um, and of course, you know, users can configure stuff and change uh, configura configuration options that are available in the charms, and so that, you know, again takes some load off the sysadmins. Um, and, you know, back to scale again. So I was just going to run through the uh, deployment quickly, what we do. So here's, uh, here's one I prepared earlier. So if you've not come across Juju before, hopefully you can make sense of some of that. Yep. Um, you know, the, the whole idea about Juju is the fact that you can deploy these charms, each one of these circles is a charm, um, and the lines between them are relations, and so metadata flows between the relations to allow different applications to configure themselves appropriately. So, this one here is quite a straightforward model. Oops, sorry about that. Um, and so, what we have here is this application called Sparkler. Sparkler is a a uh, crawling application, it's what powers um, Memex under the hood when it comes to finding out uh, what's on the dark web. And so we have this charm. This charm obviously uh, requires a server to run on. So when we drop it on, drop our model, uh, sorry, drop the charm onto our model, um, you know, that will then start provisioning a server, but it also needs some other stuff. So over here we have a solar charm. Um, and so when it's crawling, it will output this stuff to a solar core. So, you know, we need to be able to make sure that um, Sparkler can, can communicate with um, solar and vice versa. It also requ requires Spark, um, the Spark in Sparkler. Um, and so again, we deploy a Spark charm. The cool thing is, I haven't written any code for this Spark charm. It's stuff that's already in the charm store, it just exists. And because of the fact that these interfaces work in a pre-configured manner, you know, I know that when I select that relation and tell it to join, that I will be able to find the IP address, I'll be able to find what version of Spark it's running, that type of stuff. And so Sparkler can then automatically configure itself to run stuff against it. Um, and again, you know, we're running Solar Cloud, um, and so we use Zookeeper to keep the configuration in, in check. And, you know, I can deal with scale so in a, in, you know, in a much easier manner. If I want to up my Spark load, I can then just change the units on here. I can say scale application, chuck in two more, hit confirm. Probably explode, but there we go. <coughs> you know, and I've just told it to spin up two more nodes to install Spark on it, and it'll go away and do its thing. The other thing as well is, of course, how many times do you deploy stuff and you go, oh, I'll get around to dealing with the uh, monitoring and the logging at a later date because configuring Nagios is a pain. I do it quite regularly. Um, so, you know, the, the fact that all these charms have built-in support for the Nagios monitoring and also for Beats, uh, Beats from uh, the Elastic Co. Um, you know, I can deploy this, this logging and monitoring framework in, again, a couple of clicks of a mouse. And I haven't written any code. It just knows how to, how to deal with the monitoring and logging. So, you know, if I flick across to there, I created a dashboard that doesn't look very well. But, you know, um, without writing any code, I've got bits and pieces with disk utilization coming up, CPU usage, average load across the cluster, that type of stuff. And then similarly, uh, it appears to have gone offline. There you go. 
You know, similarly, um, I've hooked up Nagios, I've not written anything, the services are registered. You can also have your charms like um, register hooks into Nagios so it can monitor specific um, aspects of your um, charms. Um, but you know, again, it's just, it's quick and it's easy and from a system administrator's point of view, I haven't then spent like three hours knocking up a service definition or, you know, uh, wiring up in Puppet. Sparkler itself, uh, like I said, output stuff to Solo. So, you know, the Memex guys will like chuck through all this stuff. So I crawled the config management camp website before. And so you can see how, you know, it um, has picked up links, different URLs and images and that type of stuff. And so if this was uh, a dark web crawl, it would then keep on spidering through all these links to different sites, bringing back the images and then running image processing and detection over the top and that type of stuff. Um, you know, and this is why being able to spin up these clusters quickly and easily um, is absolutely key to what we do. <coughs> so, like the stuff that we just saw on the screen is, you know, pretty straightforward to spin up. You know, GG Bootstrap AWS that gives me an AWS instance, unsurprisingly. Uh, deploy Sparkler Basic Spark. Deploy Beats. Deploy Nagios. Deploy Zookeeper. Add some relations. Um, and then we have all that type of stuff hooked together. Of course, that's not necessarily the most straightforward thing that you could ever do for your like, end users, your developer users. And so it's quick and easy to turn all that into a bundle. And so you can do Juju, Juju Bootstrap, Juju Deploy, Sparkler Full or whatever, and you get that full stack. And you know, that's great because as a developer and as an operations guy, I've developed a platform that I'm happy with. The charms work in a specific way. Um, but then what it allows me to do is say, OK, developer guys, you can take that same code, you can take that same deployment, and you can deploy it locally onto LexD, you can deploy it into a cloud service, you can deploy it you know, in a bunch of different places. So you know, the, I can write this stuff, and AWS, GCE, LXD, OpenStack, bare metal, you know, that same stuff will run time and time again, and I don't have to worry about it, and my developers can deal with it, and everyone's reasonably happy. So, you know, what does Juju bring to the table? Um, from our perspective, it allows us to do application level modeling, multi-model support. So, you know, I showed one model there, but you can flip between different ones and have different users, um, you know, uh, use different parts of the uh, controller. Permissions, um, multi-cloud stuff. So the multi-cloud stuff is quite important. You know, the fact that we deploy this stuff to AWS, but then also we have a big OpenStack cluster. We have a bunch of stuff that runs, you know, on the OpenStack for GPU usage and that type of stuff. You know, we can deploy these same charms and de deploy the same code to, um, you know, a bunch of these different places. Um, of course, the visualizations as well, you know, I know as a system administrator, you know, I'm a command line guy, so I sit there and just hack around in, you know, bash all day. Um, but in reality, if I want to be able to try and demonstrate what I've deployed to some people within the organization, um, you know, they don't necessarily understand the output of a Juju status, where I can show them that GUI and suddenly they're like, oh yeah, I completely get it. Um, you know, so that makes a big difference. The relations between the charms are always quite important. You know, the fact that they're, they're self-configuring and self-aware, you know, just makes it easy to hook up to, to new software that appears in the charm store. Um, you know, the crowdsourcing operations is cool. I know like a bunch of the tools use it these days, but you know, the fact that everyone can contribute back to a central charm or central, you know, puppet module or whatever, you know, is great because it, I don't necessarily know how to set up all my stuff. Um, in the most optimal manner, but I do imagine that if we, you know, get all the people's heads together in this room and start hacking around on some charms or some puppet stuff, you know, that would make most of the options um, available to people. And LexD local testing. So if you haven't heard of LexD, LexD um, are like system level containers. Um, and so when you install a LexD container, a LexC, um, you will get a full operating system as opposed to just a single process like you would with Docker. And that's great because you can use LexD locally on your laptop and say like Juju deploy um, my big data bundle or Juju deploy my Sparkler bundle or whatever. And it will spin up like, you know, however many containers it needs to run all that stuff locally. And of course, yes, you don't get the same performance as if you run it on like a bunch of EC2 large instances. I fully appreciate that. 
Uh, but you know, if you want to test stuff locally, if you want to test for failure, test connectivity, that type of stuff, just make sure your charms and your code works. Then LexD local testing is great because you get a full, fully running, functioning operating system still with inside a container. So you know, going back to you know what I said a while ago, you know. <laughs> You use what works. You know, we use a number of different tools because in different parts of the organization, it's what works. You know, we use Puppet because the system administrators are used to using it um, and they're happy and they feel comfortable in doing so. We use Ansible because we have to because, you know, Wrangler won't let me install anything else, which is fair enough. And we use Puppet in, um, sorry, we use Juju in a bunch of places because it allows our developers to be able to spin up um, clusters and test things um, in a repeatable manner. You know, there isn't a wrong answer apart from writing bash scripts. If anyone writes bash scripts to deploy stuff, I will find you. Um, you know, and we care about the ease of use and scale of all these tools um, and provide a mechanism to support that. So, you know, when it comes to Juju, don't be scared. Um, I know having spoken to the system administrators at JPL and a bunch of other places over the years, you know, they're like, oh, but it doesn't have a DSL, I can't write a manifest and all that type of stuff. You know, um, Juju is flexible enough to support most of the common deployment um, scenarios that we've found. Um, and of course, it is an awful lot easier in some respects getting your bits and pieces up and running within Juju when it comes to um, not having to define a big bunch of um, backbone stuff and infrastructure stuff to get started. So, you know, if you're interested in certainly data processing, data analytics type platforms, then, um, you know, Juju obviously is a cool place to start. Um, so what's to come from the JPL side? You know, we an awful lot of this stuff that we develop is open source and ends up back on GitHub or we push up to uh, the Charm store or wherever. Um, so you know, there's going to be a bunch more Charms coming um, from JPL for, to support the Memex stack, but they will largely be uh, multifunctioning. Um, one thing that we're working on, so. Um, who here runs Kubernetes? Yeah, there we go. Who runs Mesos? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so Kubernetes and Mesos are obviously in a bit of a uh, container war at the moment. Uh, Kubernetes is winning, um, but you know, at some point, um, you know, these things will just um, sort of smooth out. Um, but one of the cool things that's, that's come recently from the Charms guys is the ability to be able to deploy Kubernetes um, you know, with, it, with Juju. Um, the missing piece of that puzzle is the ability to then do it to deploy workloads to Kubernetes or to Mesos or whatever with Juju. So one thing we're working on at JPL is the ability for us to be able to do like Juju deploy um, Apache Mesos and get like a nice Mesos cluster running on our data center and then Juju bootstrap um, and then run LexD containers with inside the Mesos and eventually I guess it will come to Kubernetes as well. You know, because system containers are great when it comes to deploying flexible workloads and that type of stuff and not having to deal with the Docker like service discovery um, hooks and interesting caveats when it comes to deploying um, scalable containers inside Kubernetes, inside Mesos. So, you know, one thing we're trying to do is get this LexD support into Mesos and probably Kubernetes because we run both. Um, and the other thing as well is hopefully we'll provide, we'll be writing a provider for Wrangler so we can start deploying those charms to Wrangler um, via Juju. Anyway, so there you go. There's my rambling. I've nearly got us through to lunchtime. Um, yeah. Any questions? Excellent.